Good morning and welcome back. Just a few reminders before we start. Please remember to silence all your devices. Please download the event app. It will help you schedule your day. It is also where you can share feedback after every session you attend today. All AWS sessions you see today are being recorded and available after the session via content devices on exit. Now, please welcome to the stage Andrew Thornton from AWS, who will present on changing dynamics in video in education. Andrew, please. Thank you. Thank you very much and, uh, and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. My role is uh, looking after AWS Elemental and AWS Media Services, and I have a, an Asia Pacific wide role. So I've, a lot of our customers talk to us about uh, Elemental, and Elemental historically has been an on-premise uh, data center solution. And uh, latterly, we've been uh, talking to customers about media services in the cloud and AWS media services. So we bridge both sides. We take the on-prem, we take the cloud, and we offer the hybrid solutions. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, before just jumping into these stats, I'd just, take, just like to um, spend a little bit of time talking about media services. Media services were introduced at reInvent uh, two years ago. Last year at reInvent, we added uh, a, 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 a later service, a Media Connect service. So we now have six media services. They're cloud-based solutions. They're cloud-based services. And they allow the processing of video in the cloud, the origination of video in the cloud for distribution over content um, networks, such CDN, such as CloudFront. So that sort of a little bit as a way of introduction to the topic of uh, the changing dynamics in video and education. Because this move to cloud of the video processing has led to so many options, and it's these options that are changing the way that video is distributed, changing the way it's processed, and changing the way it's used and deployed uh, in many, many markets, whether that's broadcast market, the enterprise market, education, government, et cetera. So move to cloud is really a catalyst driving change. So if we look at some of the um, statistics, let's start with some statistics. There's um, stati statistics coming from Wisconsin, Madison University in 2018, and these statistics were around student preferences. And the statistics are really spelling out that students really appreciate video and video in their um, communication with their um, professors and their lecturers. They like the recording of content, they like the ability to be able to go back and to refresh themselves if they've missed a, se uh, missed a session. Uh, so video is becoming important to students. It's also very important for the educators, for the actual professors and the lecturers giving the, giving the uh, sessions. Kaltura did a similar exercise talking to the actual educators. And educators absolutely agreed that video was important in communicating effectively the sessions. There's 92% of educators think it increases the student satisfactions, and there's a series of statistics all in the high 80s about better retention rates, better engagement, and better, uh, better end user satisfaction for their um, pupils. Now, in the existing use cases, of video, we see it being really deployed around taking content from YouTube and Vimeo, et cetera, public uh, sources of video. Now this is good, it, it's uh, helping enormously, and this is what's widely used. Kaltura asked, if you had an option on platforms, would you actually prefer a different platform than, rather than taking the video just off the free sites? And 66% of the educators came back and said, yes, absolutely. You know, we don't have any control over the uh, presentation, we can't uh, be clear on the security, there is branding, and also we can't extend, um, extend what we're doing, extend what we're doing with this video. It's all packaged up and ready to go. We can't add subtitles, for example, we can't modify it, we can't change it easily. So 66% of them are looking at actually multiple platforms today, 
and 17% of them are only sitting on pure single platforms. So there's definitely a move to multiple platforms and to better utilize video. So I think that based on those statistics, video is so important to the uh, education sector and it's increasingly becoming so. Now, let's have a look at some of the typical uh, use cases for video. Really falls into two categories. We've got a VOD category, which is video on demand, taking files, taking live video, recording it, putting it into a file, and then on request or on demand, playing that file out. Typical use cases for video on demand is course material, student assignments, it's capturing lectures, and it's put in classrooms, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty standard re uh, sets of requirements for VOD. Now live, live video is the actual streaming of video, such as the camera we have here. If you take a feed off the back of this camera and you can stream that video anywhere around the world to, uh, uh, with any content, with any time zones. So this leads to <coughs> remote teaching. Uh, it's been used in remote teaching and learning. It's used for campus events, such as you know, soccer games, such as uh, sporting events generally. It's also used if there's presentations that want to be streamed out. If a CEO or a head lecturer or a professor is talking, you may be speaking to one set of um, pupils in one country at one campus, and it may be streamed to other campuses around the city, it may be streamed to campuses around the country, or it may be streamed to uh, remote campuses in uh, different countries around the world. We have 24 by 7 channels, as opposed to the events, which is the live campus. It's an event. It's a single thing that happens for a short period of time. We build up, we deliver it, and we shut it down. Campus channels tend to be more 24 by 7, such as a TV channel would be running continuously. And then the last piece, uh, piece on live, which is really improved, increasing enormously, is user-generated content. This is content that... Um, Pupils can often create their own projects or wish to communicate like on a back channel by uploading their content from cell phones. We're actually seeing a very large project coming together in Korea doing exactly this with a, an English learning school uh, streaming um, around the world, actually. So let's have a look at a couple of the obstacles that are preventing the adoption in education. I think a lot of it comes around to knowledge and the lack of knowledge. Things are changing so fast. It's important that educators and you guys know what the options are. Secondly, cost of ownership. Absolutely, the cost of the infrastructure to provide streaming video, to record, uh, to broadcast, if you will, has been very, very prohibitive. You've had to have encoders on the ground. You have to have broadcast chains, in effect, going to origin servers, DRM servers, and then going out to um, CDNs and the streaming to the devices. Security and privacy. This is also really important and becoming more so uh, as content becomes more precious. You know, content is king, content's where the value sits and it needs to be highly protected, whether it's in education or whether it's a top movie or whether it's a brand new marketing release of a car, et cetera, et cetera. That content is highly valuable and has to be secure. And the second barrier, uh, sorry, the last barrier is the inability to customize. I quickly mentioned, if you've got content that you can't customize, it, it's, it really is it's limiting. You know, if you want to personalize it, if you want to brand it, uh, uh, if you want to, as I say, add subtitles or multilingual subtitles, this is uh, some of the barriers to getting better value out of the video. So moving on, video in education at a glance, it's really pretty straightforward. On the left-hand side here of the chart, you see the origination. This could be a live feed from a camera. It could be from a cell phone. It could be from VOD files that have been created previously. The second step is then to process that video. It's to take it, to, to encode it to the right bit rates so that the players, um, the devices can play the content. You've got to create the, the, the correct bit rate stacks Secondly, you then have to package it. You have to wrap it so that the actual players can understand it and play it, whether it's HLS or Dash or another MSS, for example. And at this stage, prior to the origin, it's important to add DRMs to protect if you wish to use DRMs, or it's important to watermark using watermarking. So in other words, adding that level of security around your content so that you know that the 
player that's playing it has got the approvals and the authorizations to actually play that clip. Content is then moved across to an origin. From the origin, it goes to the delivery. Delivery is through uh, CDN, uh, CDN's cache and then deliver. Uh, CloudFront, uh, obviously AWS CDN, fully integrated with the media services, but other CDNs, uh, absolutely no problem. So there are various ways of um, providing these services in AWS, and it really depends on your needs, your levels, your in-house skills, and the investment that you wish to make. At the lowest level, we have the core services. You can build out on top of the core services. We have actually developed a number of these core services that have been pulled together. We've added media solutions in AWS Media Solutions to provide a solutions layer. Now on the chart, you can see a solution for live streaming. You can see a solution for VOD, VOD assets, and playing VOD assets out. There are a couple of other solutions here as well. The multi-language subtitling, integrating the AI ML solutions. And we've got media analysis solutions. And these tend to be the solutions that sit in that media workflow. And at the highest level, we have our terrific partner network. The partners can help customize these solutions to your requirements. What I'd like to do in the next few slides is actually look at the partner network solutions and the media solutions from AWS Media Services. So as I mentioned, there are, great bench, there are great benefits in using the solutions. We've packaged the solutions up into starter kits, and I'm going to talk through a couple of the start, starter kits with you this morning. The benefit of the starter kit is to take the media services and package it up into a solution to get that workflow automated to easily and quickly help you get going. So we've done this. They're well architected. They have the opportunity to expand. You can grow easily uh, on, these, on the basis of these starter kits. And it's a way to get you going and to get things moving. Secondly, we can take those starter kits and they can be taken by our partners who can take them and customize them to your requirements. They can either add, they can then add other functionality into it, such as the watermarking and the DRM solutions. They can add some of those AI ML solutions into it and integrate for you a fully automated solution, which can be implemented straight from the console in a single click. They are all CloudFront template, templated and they can be implemented really quickly. For example, we quite regularly in the media services team do demonstrations for customers uh, and it takes literally 10 to 12 minutes to set up a live video channel. So we could take the feed from the back of this camera, put a small bonded cellular pack on the back of it to feed on-ramp those feeds into the cloud. We could process the video, we could package the video. Once CloudFront is configured, we could stream it out over CloudFront to your devices here on your cell phones. Depending on the time it takes to for CloudFront to configure and the regions we want it in, probably 10, 12, 20 minutes to put a live channel on air. When we've finished using that channel, we can just switch it off and it goes away and the cost is zero. Remember, these are services. They're all pay-as-you-go. They're all fully, fully um, robust, resilient, self-healing. So if we look at uh, a couple of use cases for live streaming um, of events, for live streaming solution, we've got events and we've got channels. Specifically, the difference here with the event is it's a one-off. It's where you really don't want to have a lot of infrastructure on the ground. You want to be able to spin up what you need, when you need it to cover the event, the presentation, the soccer match, uh, short-term broadcast, sporting events, et cetera, et cetera. When you're finished, take it all down and it's finished and the, the cost goes away. Used for large town hall meetings, as I say, sporting events is, is the best example. We have a video at the end which is centered around exactly that. The channels, you can have a campus channel. As I mentioned, it tends to be more 24 by 7. The costing that we actually associate with these two reflects that. If you have a 24 by 7, we can move to the reserve pricing and the costs come down considerably. Obviously, if it's on demand, we have a higher cost ourselves. And we have a slightly higher pricing for on-demand. 
typically a 24 by 7 channel running just doing the video processing, excluding the cloud front, probably about $1,000 a month for an HD channel today. So very, really low uh, entry level costs um, coming with the cloud. This is, a tip, sorry, this is a typical architecture of a streaming solution. You can see sources coming in from the live source um, through in, into the cloud to Elemental Live for that first step of the processing. Second step of processing, packaging and origination out to CloudFront through to those devices, which could be cell phones, tablets, uh, set-top boxes, computers, or uh, smart TVs. Okay. One point I'd also like to make on the diagram is you'll see that there's two arrows as they go across the workflow here. This re represents a live, live feed. So in other words, we have two feeds going across exactly the same, being processed the same, and exactly in sync. So they're actually frame accurate as they go through, except they have different paths, they're in different data centers, and they're in different AZs. So should one of those go down, for example, you happen to be carrying the UEFA Cup final or the Indian cricket final, and one of those has an EC2 that hiccups, then we have live, live, and the second feed is absolutely in sync and is completely seamless. Now, in the real world of broadcast, that's not quite how they operate. It's incredibly expensive to do live, live. Imagine running twin satellite links live, live. So what tends to happen is customers will put prime channels on live, live, and they use single path, so we just have one of the paths through here, and they have an N plus one. So if an encoder were to break down in their data center, then um, a cold standby encoder would be started up, and they would switch across, and there'd be a glitch in the transmission. We do something similar, and we have a single path, and we have a, a rebuilding process, except the EC2s can rebuild in less than 60 seconds. So even if you're on a single path, and the cost associated with single path is 50% of the dual path. So this is enabling us to offer these services to a much, much wider audience than what was typically offered to broadcast because for non-live live channels, just single path, we can again offer it at an incredibly competitive um, level on pricing. Examples of uh, these live workflows, this Ravensbourne University here, offering um, live feeds to 82 to eight, over 82,000 school children, 645 schools. Uh, it's a uh, broadcast of the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company. This is an on-demand situation, so when the broadcasts are required, the system's fired up. We stream out, all the, um, stream out to all the um, pupils in the schools, and then we shut it down. This was done on a particularly tight budget, uh, and the um, cloud solution was sufficiently flexible to allow them to deliver very successfully. This is the uh, Ravensbourne uh, School workflow. As I mentioned, it's very similar to um, the uh, basic um, package that we were offering um, in the, in the um, startup kits. Let me just pass through a couple of these slides because we have a deck here which is an older deck unfortunately. These are examples of use cases that we have used previously. Okay, in the purpose of time, let me move straight to the video on demand sections here. Video on demand, the VOD, two use cases, library conversions where you've got an existing library and you want to transcode it to deliver uh, at a different format in a, in a, for different devices uh, because they may have been renewed. I mean, new cell phones have been introduced, for example, so you want to make that media applicable to those devices. The second area is where you've got content coming in from different areas and you need to match to the mezzanine content that you have in your library. So you may be getting clips in from overseas, you may be getting user-generated content clips in, you may be getting clips that have been created by taking live video and cutting out the sections that you wish and then encoding those to provide VOD assets. So these are some of the use cases that we see for VOD and VOD libraries. The VOD uh, video on demand solution is uh, a series of functions that put that into an automated process, enabling you to take any clip, drop it in the bucket on the left hand side here, 
a series of lambda and step functions. We'll take that and automate the process. The engine, if you will, is the elemental media convert, which is actually doing the transcoding, the orange block in the center there. The output of it, uh, once completed, goes to the S3 bucket on the right-hand side. So that's your, code, that's your clip uh, and file in its new format, ready to go. Now that, uh, that green bucket on the right-hand side, that S3 bucket, can actually be used as an origin, and you can actually stream from that origin through CloudFront out to your devices. Again, a couple of, a couple of examples here. This is an interesting example. Um, it's one where we've used um, a proprietary codec. It's called QVBR. This is a codec that AWS Elemental have uh, devised themselves. What QVBR does, it's quality variable bit rate, and it actually delivers savings in the bandwidth and the storage by reducing the number of bits necessary to convey or to encode a picture successfully and play it at a satisfied the required resolution or video quality. So if you think about it, if you've got a newsreader or a talking head, you've got very little motion, so you need few bits to encode that. There's very little changes in scenes. The newsreader is basically staying still. There may be a few cuts away uh, and back again. So you need very few bits to encode that. So you don't need the full bandwidth of the pipe. You don't need all those other bits. You only need the bits dictating the changes in that picture. If you were to take a sporting event, a soccer match, where the cameras are panning across a field, panning across players in motion, or actually the hardest one is surfing. If you actually take people surfing and the waves rolling in, this needs the maximum number of bits because so much in that picture is changing every second, every millisecond. So what QVBR does is it analyzes in real time uh, the video and it allocates the amount or the number of bits that you require to, to deliver the desired quality for the device that you're playing out on. It can reduce costs considerably. In this particular example here, there is a 50% cost saving on these file-based VOD assets. QVBR can be run in real time. Um, so you can take uh, the World Cup cricket, for example. You can use the QVBR codec to encode that, and the savings there are 20 to 25%. And as you're going out to over 20 million simultaneous users, the savings are absolutely huge. So that's just an example of where you can use QVBR uh, in, addition to the, uh, um, in addition to the process. Um, I've indicated. This is a simple workflow. Again, uh, let me just click through a couple of sides here. University of Auckland. Univer University of Auckland is a similar workflow to the actual reference workflow uh, or the starter kit workflow. A um, couple of differences here is that they're using to on-ramp a very small uh, elemental encoder. I'm actually showing you the size here in my, my hands. It's a portable, small, on-ramp encoding device, so you could take this camera here, rather than using a bonded cellular to go to cloud, you could actually use a um, hardware device that plugs into the back of the camera and then into the internet, and off we go up onto the cloud. I think the other point for the Auckland, uh, yeah, the Auckland uh, case study here is that uh, we can move to play out to CDNs and also to social media. So they're playing to not just the CDN, but also to social media such as Facebook and YouTube. Let me just move through a couple of slides here. Okay, this is a, a machine learning solution. Again, I must apologize, this is an old deck that I've been given here. So in terms of the resources that we have available, we have got terrific references in education. We've got white papers in education, uh, and we've also got blog posts. The case studies that I've had to quickly go through, you can find on these reference points. And really importantly, these are the one-click templates. So if you want to do live streaming, you want to do on-demand, and you want to do multi-language subtitling, please go to the websites and uh, click on these overviews. We actually have a booth here, just, just the other side, adjacent to this uh, uh, lecture theater here, and we can actually show you how to set these up and how to get going, okay? They're there, they're accessed through the console, 
and they are actually built and devised by solutions architects who first started going to customers with media services and customers came back and said, can you help me do this, 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 and this? Okay, so we actually put this, 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 and this into a solution, made it so that it was simple to use, and it did 90% of what the customers wanted to do. Because it's on the cloud, it scales. It scales automatically, whether you put one clip into that bucket or you put a thousand clips in, it doesn't matter. The cloud will take care of it. If you want to stream your uh, video live to 100 or 50 or 3 million, 6 million, it doesn't matter. The cloud and those solutions will take care of it. They scale according to demand. This is a huge benefit that you cannot get anywhere else except in the cloud. I think that brings me to our Voice of the Customer video, slightly ahead of time. This Voice of the Customer, Mark Kramer, he's um, the C uh, CTO of the 12-pack um, group of universities on the west coast of America. The universities got together. They decided that the best way to um, cover their games and their activities in these colleges, 12 of them, was to combine to, in effect, build a little broadcast center between them. They chose AWS and the cloud as the vehicle to do that, and they then streamed that content of college. College, college sports in the States, I'm, I'm sure you know, is, is a big deal. So they stream these college games, or it's basketball, football, or whatever. They scale up, they deliver, and then they shut down. So they only spend the money when they have to. The quality is there, it's at broadcast over quality, and they've also been, to add, been able to add on a vast number of AWS uh, additional services, whether it's AIML, whether it's analytics, or whether it's ad insertion, server-side ad insertion, which can all be put into the, into the video streams. It's a, another subject, and I haven't got the time to cover AIML and ad insertion, but it's a, it's a huge opportunity for everybody. So let me just play this video, um, and it should work. Pac-12 Networks is the wholly owned networks of the Conference of Champions, the Pac-12. Our mission is to connect fans to the schools and sports they love. So that's everything from being able to watch the game anywhere they want to watch it, however they want to watch it, presenting really great VOD content to them. It is about us understanding our fans better and using data to help tailor the experience to fans better, and by leveraging some new cutting edge technology to create things that no one's ever seen before. Our objective is to find more ways to drive revenue back to our schools so that we can support their athletics departments. So the Pac-12 has gone all in on the AWS cloud. What that means for us is the ability to experiment without having to have a big capital investment up front. It also means that we can scale to meet the demands of our consumers when we have our biggest events and then when our season ends, allowed to be able to scale down. And the final part of this is around cost efficiency. It's allowed us to iterate much faster in our digital products. So we're using a lot of different services. So it's everything from the database services like AuroraDB to EC2 instances. We're using elastic load balancers, S3 and Glacier. We measure our archive in petabytes. In the past, we had lots and lots of great game footage, but it's locked down in here. We're not able to leverage it all the ways that our fans would like to experience it. By putting that content into S3, we're able to interact with our partners better, create new opportunities for syndication, better international distribution opportunities, and lots of incredible ways for us to chop that content up and give it to consumers in our own digital properties. Now we're starting to work with many of the machine learning services like Recognition and SageMaker. The places that we're starting to focus on today are things like closed captioning. How do we make our content more accessible to fans? We're really excited about thinking about ways we can clip great highlights out of content in an automated fashion at scale. When you have this much content, it would be incredible if you could look at every great play by a single player or every great play by a team. We broadcast 850 live events every year on our linear channels. We broadcast another 350 to 400 events on our digital channels, our TV Everywhere application, and produce over 200 hours of studio programming. Going into this season, we migrated our seven live linear 24 hour a day TV streams from on-prem hardware to the AWS Elemental Media Services. Part of that, we're using uh, Media Live 
and media package to deliver content to consumers. Well, being able to deliver a custom audience to an advertiser that's stitched directly into a stream is something that we think is really a great opportunity for both advertisers and for fans. It's great for fans because we can better target ads that are more relevant to them, and it's better for advertisers because they're getting in front of audiences that matter. It's a really incredibly powerful technology that's very simple to set up. Getting Media Tailor built into your infrastructure, pretty quick. And really what, we, what we're thinking about right now is this is just the beginning. What we're most excited about is the things that we haven't even thought of yet. And we know that we've got the capabilities to actually pursue those. So there, I think that's a, a really good example of wrapping together everything of what AWS can do in an educational uh, media environment. So thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions, please come over and uh, see me. I'll be at the booth uh, just behind. If you want to see some demonstrations on subtitling or some of those um, workflows that I've talked about, please come and talk to us. Have a look at the survey. I do apologize for having to move through a couple of those uh, extra slides. But uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Please remember to submit your feedback on this session in the app. If you are interested in having a copy of the slides, please tap your badge on the content devices at the exit. There will now be a tea break at the Partners and Solutions Expo just outside this room. And the next session is the keynote address at Hall 406 on Level 4, and it will begin promptly at 10.45 AM. Thank you.